so excited to be here today. First of all, thank you all for braving the elements. I mean, it's Maine after all. It's like, oh my God, snow's falling out of the sky. Um, we, we all made it, so that's fantastic. I, I have just um, been in this sort of Catherine Marie coma for the past few days. I, I've already had so many conversations with her. I, this is sort of redundant to me. Uh, if she hadn't shown up today, that's not in the snow. I could have just conducted this whole interview by myself. Uh, I, I guess probably we should start. Um, I, I will just very quickly introduce myself, um, and then I'm going to ask Catherine to introduce herself and just give a brief synopsis of this beautiful, beautiful book. Um, my name is Elizabeth Peavy, and I am a main, importantly, <coughs> writer. Uh, uh, those of you who have been around a while you may best know me by my columns from Casper Day Weekly and the Baller and my humor columns, uh, or more recently, my one woman show, My Mother's Clothes Are Not My Mother. Uh, there's been a whole bunch of stuff in between, uh, but that, that's sort of the, the, the bookend of, of my career. Uh, I have just finished actually the book version of the show. And I'm very interested to compare, <laughs> um, to, to, to compare some notes with Catherine when, when we get into the conversation. But um, first of all, I'd just like to turn it over to Catherine for a moment and just let her introduce herself and the book. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Just make sure you're ready. My name is Catherine Murray. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm very honored to be here with Liz and be here at the library with you all. So, synopsis of the book? Sure. Yes. 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 Yeah. Um, so, the, it's a story of uh, when I first, a long time ago, went to Thailand to teach English at a refugee camp. And I lived there about a year and I fell in love with a local man and we got married and had three kids and then uh, we're living quite the idyllic life on the banks of the Mekong, running bicycle tours and eating mangoes and sticky rice and pad thai and green curry and with a huge extended family and a whole neighborhood of people eager to help us parent. So it was really a wonderful life. And then uh, quite suddenly out of the blue, my middle child, Ed, right after his fifth birthday, was diagnosed with a very rare form of leukemia. So the story, the book is really the story of going from that life to, to living with his illness and um, ultimately being with him right, you know, until his demise. Well then, all right, we're taking the gun out of the holster, here we go. <coughs> so that one, did that work? This is, yeah. Okay. Much better. Okay. Great. How about this? Yeah. this testing, testing, one, two, three. Right. I mean, really, I can just do this. I, you know, I teach public speaking, so I can use the... I'm not going to. We'll do this. Uh, I guess uh, maybe, maybe a great place to start is uh, to talking about how somebody takes such... I, I mean, I can't even begin to fathom the, the, the depth of this tragedy and how, how one takes something like this and frames it into a story that, that you can put on the page. I mean, it, I, I guess the, the, the starting point is where did you begin? Well, I think, um, you know, that's something I had to ask myself in recent years when I was trying to make it into a story. But really, I started at the very beginning. For me, I think what helped me survive going through such a difficult experience, um, and I want to say that I, I don't think tragedy is really applies for me. Uh, to me, the word tragedy has more to do with like genocide and incest and, you know, just really sort of horrific, unnatural things. And the death of a child is incredibly painful, but it's not completely outside the realm of human normalcy. So I think it is a really, you know, a very difficult thing. Um, but in order to to live through that, I feel like I sort of made it into story every day for myself um, in the sense that I I needed to write every day, I needed to journal. That was really how I handled the emotions um, or survived the emotions. So I kind of had a head start in that way and then I kept a, a really detailed journal. So much of the book is just the journal. Um, and then it was in, after he died, I knew I, I wanted it to become a book. I wanted to share his story and I wanted to reach out to other grieving parents and. Um, articulate what I think is can be so hard for us to articulate, which is you know the grief and the pain. And, um, but going from 
from journal to memoir was another story that was that was hard. So that for that, um, I tried to do it by myself for about ten years. I kept every now and then I would take out these hundreds and hundreds of pages of journal and think, all right, how do I make this into a book? And it was always just so overwhelming. I just couldn't. I would just become reimmersed in all the pain of the time and um, and give up. So finally, I went to I went for professional help, and I went to the Stone Coast MFA program, um, which is a wonderful program here in Portland. It's a low residency program, two years with amazing faculty and peers. And for that, um, I only had to turn in 18 pages at a time, so I could go through the journals and pull out 18 pages, and that that I could handle. I, I guess, you know, talking about this, because I, I, I have taught um, memoir before, it was actually called memoir, uh, they didn't know what to do with it back 20-something years ago. Uh, and and when, when I have my students come, I actually, just this past Saturday, um, did a workshop called How to Frame a Life. And to me, th this is one of the biggest stumbling blocks, um, hurdles, downfalls of people who try to deal with their own personal stories, they don't know how to get in and they don't know how to get out, and they don't know how to narrow their focus. And the thing that struck me so much about this beautiful book is how narrow and lean it is. Mm. And I guess following in the structure um, vein is, is how you were able to decide, for, for example, there's almost no backstory. I mean, we, we have no idea who you are. You've just graduated from college and boom, you land you know, in, in, in Thailand. And that's basically, every once in a while you lift up the veil, it's like, uh, you know, my mother worked, I was in an affluent subject, Fred Flintstone was my best friend. Actually, Merv Griffin was my best friend. So we have to share some, you know, the, the common after school activity here. Uh, you know, and, and, and your mother shows up and brings a little Christmas tree, but there's almost no mention of your history or your family. And when one is telling a story this deep, I mean, how did you make that choice to eliminate everything that happened until you landed on Thai soil? Mm -hmm. Well, it's funny because the, the landing on Thai soil really was the backstory for me. Because for me, when I wanted to write the book, the most alive part of the story for me was those last few months before his death when we lived up on the top of the mountain with no running water and no electricity and it was just very bare bones. And for me, that was the story. Um, and I toyed with just having that be the story, you know, just those few months. But I had some good advice from um, my mentor, Rick Bass, who's an amazing writer. And he said, we need to know more, we need to know the story. So I had to go back and, and create all that and, and figure out how much to put in. But, but that felt like, to me, that felt like too much, you know, to go all the way back. And I think also one thing that was hard to figure out as a writer was, um, what order to go in. Originally I had thought, oh, we should start with something really grabby, you know, like the funeral, that, that should be the opening scene, you know. And, um, but Rick was adamant that if, if the story is good enough to stand on its own regular, you know, just chronological order is enough. You don't need to do any flashy jumping around in time stuff, just once upon a time, the end, and straight through. Well, that was another thing that struck me because, again, when I have students come to me and guilty is charged, that try to overcomplicate the story, you know, and, and, and very often the first thing I'll do to a manuscript when I'm working with someone is disrupt that linear chronology. You know, it's like, you know, the autobiography is linear. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, life is linear, but memoir is more novelistic and more digressive. And, you know, yes, started in a flashy moment or started in a moment of crisis and then pull the camera back. But the thing, the thing that really, again, struck me about this book is how clean and uncomplicated the story was. I, I mean, almost episodic. You know, the, the, again, the very first thing I say is don't get into this happened, then that happened, then this happened, then that happened, and then this happened, and then that happened, which is exactly what you did with this book, and yet it was the perfect vehicle for the story because that, that just that um, simple structure had this much level of remove that made it bearable. Mm -hmm. That made it bearable maybe for you to tell the story, but also for a reader. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I have to say, you all have to get this book, by the way. You cannot live without reading this book, is I, I reserved Sunday afternoon. I knew, and it's Chan. 
Chong was dying. I knew we, I mean, I'm, no spoiler alert here. And I said, you know, it's Sunday afternoon. I'm turning my bone off and I am going to cry all afternoon. I was so excited to have this good cry. And I didn't cry. I didn't cry because I believe that you delivered me like you delivered your son to that moment where it was inevitable and, as you say, natural. I felt, I felt transported to that moment safely, which was, again, the art of the way that you constructed this memoir. So, Rick, good mentoring. But, it, but it's, also, it's, it's also very artfully created. I mean, you know, we start with that sort of, you know, death by water, <clears throat> death by water, and end by death by water. And it's so, so, beautifully, so beautifully constructed. And the thing, I, I guess maybe what I would love you to talk about a little bit more is the title and mm -hmm. how that, it, because I, I felt there was so much of this and so much of this in the book and those two contrasts, again, talking about structure. Now you see the sky. So the title comes from when, sorry, when, um, when Chad was born, uh, he was born at home in our house in Thailand, which is in a, kind of a big village, but you know, very cheap by jail with all the other houses. And um, so I was in labor at home and um, making lots of noise. And the neighbors, the next day, one of the neighbor women came over and said, oh, I thought somebody was drunk over here you know, <laughs> with all the shouting. But um, yeah, so, so he was born at home that night. And then the next morning, um, and his, his, my ex-husband's mother, my ex-mother-in-law, had been there through the whole thing, as well as our you know, close friends and family. And, um, so the next morning when we were talking to the new baby and you know just being so happy to have him there and how you do with the baby you know and uh, my uh, ex-husband's mother said um ma leo hen fa dai leo di jai ma you know so she said like here you are you've arrived with us you're out here and now you can see the sky and i just that just struck me in that moment it's such a beautiful thing to say to a newborn human being so right and and yet, in the contrast, there is so much, I mean, to me, that's the open expanse of coming into the world, and yet there's... But, is that better? Okay. Uh, there's so much womb imagery. Like, like I feel like, like everything that happens in the interiors, of, especially your hut up in the mountains, and, and in that bed, the, the, the family all sleeps together, uh, e even when Chan is sick and dying. And, and it, is, it, it, is, it is cocooning and wombing. And yet, when you go out into the, I mean, again, I don't, this is no spoiler alert, but, but after Chan dies, the first, not the first thing, but when, when you finally rouse yourself, and I just thought that this was such a beautiful, natural moment, is that um, Catherine goes out into the hillside and there's a big gibbous moon kind of hanging over the hillside, and she kneels and well, scooches down and pees. And how the earth drinks up her pee, and she's looking at that moon, and she says, every time I see a moon like that, from now on, that's going to be my life. And to me, it was, it was another birth. I mean, you know, the, 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 the death and that transition and going out, and there's, there's birth scenes. As, as someone who's never had a child, I, you know, ordinarily I'd be like, yeah. I, it just it, again because in her hand, her her craft and her hand, it just everything felt so natural. And I all, I, I, and now I have to jump back and say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say tragedy. That was the whole lesson of the book. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm so Western. I'm so Western. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, because because you made everything feel so natural, and that that contrast between. The, the light and the dark and the womb and the sky and the, the, the river taking taking Chan away, all of those all of those artful things that made this a journey and and you referred to his leaving us as, as a journey. I think we were there with you and that doesn't happen by accident. That happens by craft and beautifully done. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yes, there's definitely craft. There's definitely purposeful use of things. I also want to say to the writers that uh, trust your subconscious. Um, I almost always wrote very, very early in the morning when I first woke up, woke up 
Um, so a lot of those things, like you said, it opens with death by water and ends with death by water. I didn't realize that until you just said that just now. <laughs> so I, I just want to say that, you know, as a writer, um, I, I guess I, I put a lot of faith into what my mind gives me um, without a lot of, you know, if you, if you can manage to find a place where you're open to your subconscious and to what, what the urges are that make you write, you know, be, I'll be honoring of that and really be true to that because it works it works out well when you when you're able to really listen. Well, sometimes we don't know what we're saying until somebody else tells us what we just said. So that, that works out nicely. Uh, I, I guess one of the other things that that I was so struck by was the um, contrast of cultures, and th that you definitely you know in even in initially Chan's treatment you know were half Western and half Thai. I mean, you, you wanted to uh, honor the land that you were living in and your husband's family's customs and what they wanted to do, and yet the minute they said the C word, you rushed back to Seattle. Uh, it's, it, I would just like to offer a contrast because one of the things that I was, I was noting as I was reading the book is every, every step that you made, everything that you did was with the tempo of time and earth and naturalness, uh, whereas in the Western world, everything that we do about death is, a, it's, we have to stop it. You know, the, the, losing somebody is, as you said in the book, it, it's a battle. I, I just think about like my mother's, my mother's um, decline and death we just kept, you know, one ER visit after the other, one mini stroke, one ER, you know, I mean, it's just like one thing after the other, I'm pumping her back to life, I'm pumping her back to life, going, going, have to sustain, have to sustain. And, you know, at one point I, I, I ask in the book, did we save her to death? Because we could not let her go. And yet the whole, again, this, this launching that, that you do of your son, that at some point you say enough, Let's go home. And what what the family does is, you know, they, they make beautiful food that they grow, and the papayas, and the greens, and the juices, and the rainwater that they drink. And it's everything is so gentle. And and in Western society, we we don't usher people out well. We you know stick them to death before they go. And and you really gave this. It was a launching. And, and so beautiful, and I guess what, what, you, you do this beautifully on the page, but perhaps you could talk a little bit about that internal culture, I wouldn't say war, but conflict. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, had, had there been any hope that we could have kept him alive with whatever, whatever you know, difficult, challenging, uh, non-natural way, we certainly would have. But the doctors in Seattle, you know, when they said, all right, he's relapsed, he's not gonna survive another more than two or three months, um, then we said, okay, you know, we're gonna go back to Thailand and, and try to save him with, uh, try to fight the cancer with more natural, um, traditional, traditional Thai ways, which is um, nutrition and exercise and meditation, and positive thinking and a lot of juicing. Um, mega doses of vitamins. So it was it's, it was almost a blessing, I think. I mean, if he was going to die, it was good that we were told by the American doctors there's nothing at all we can do. So then we were free to go ahead back and, and take care of him as best we could using much more gentle ways. Um, but yes, it, it was a struggle. It was very hard for me to um, to not give up, to not, I think there was so much authority in what um, the doctors told us in Seattle after he relapsed when they said he's not going to survive, he's going to die within a couple months. It just really uh, went in, you know, I thought that's it, you know, what, what, what they say is the truth. And it took me some time to recognize that um, nobody can predict the future, no matter, you know, how many medical degrees you have and no matter what you've seen. Anything is possible, and the human body is always uh, recreating itself, you know, cell by cell. So I had to really teach myself to become not just a positive thinker, but just to really wake up each morning and say, it's a new day, we can fight, we can keep, keep at this battle and not give up. 
because there was part of me that wanted to just say, well, the doctor said this is it, I'm just going to be very kind of calm and intellectual and explain to my child that, you know, to prepare for death. And, but there was something in me as a mother that knew that that was not okay, that I really had to fight for him. Even though that struggle between those two places was almost excruciating um, in the sense of, I mean, I think keeping hope alive was somehow more difficult for me than, than just wanting to cave in and be a victim. Um, you know, which sounds really weird because of course I didn't want to lose my child, but, but the hope was painful because it's like, you know, I had to be so pain, hope, so hopeful and yet always in the back of my mind knowing this might not, this might not happen. You know, he could die, but I have to keep fighting. Does that make any sense? Oh, of course it does. Sorry to uh, articulate. No, I know. And I, I guess um, coming into the, the candor of the book, because you think about a uh, woman, mother, who has a child with cancer and she's a hero. I mean, you know, I mean, you're, you're, you're with your son almost 24 hours a day, I, you know, you're begging, you know, the hour that you can go, go sit at your laptop or go sit out on your platform and look at that. I mean, it's, it's exhausting and it's enervating and all of those things. And you dare to say that in, in the book, which again, you, you, I think you even say you don't want to be the, the heroic cancer mom or the, the victim mom, is that this is your job, but it's not any fun. And you make that very, and, and again, you know, that's what's so nice about this book is that there's so much candor in it that she's not saying, oh, you know, when I get up in the morning, it's such a pleasure to be able to, you know, bathe my son, you know, it's like, would he stop crying for five minutes so I can not scream? I mean, and, and I guess, again, making those choices about what to share with the reader, you know, we all want to be the likable narrator. We all want people to admire us and think well of us. Uh, you know, the whole basis of my book and show is that I sucked. <laughs> My mother wasn't the greatest mother in the world, I wasn't the greatest character in the world, but I tried and I did my best and you were awesome. Uh, and, on, and, and there's there's nothing, you know, showing up and it's like, look, look at what a fantastic character Bryce, is because she's complaining a lot of the time about everything that she's doing. But figuring out what you're going to share with the reader so that it doesn't feel like, look at me, cancer mom, but also it's like, this is so hard. Yeah, it was, um, and yeah, I have to think about how to respond. I mean, um, I think that one thing that helps that voice and that um, portrayal of oneself is I, I try to err on the side of more scene than reflection in the book. You know, I try to just be true to this is what happened and being very specific about sensory details and, and trying to have less mind chatter. I mean, it's definitely in there in my reflections. I think you know the fact that it was that it was journal. Those reflections really happened. I, I would say probably most of the reflective stuff in the book is moment to moment. You know, stuff that I recorded as I was thinking, like I was thinking out loud. So it's it's like I didn't have space between now and here to kind of um, you know embellish that. Does that make any sense? So it was very authentic. Right, right, and, and I mean sometimes some, when, when somebody is putting together a piece like this and you have that raw emotion on the page because you were journaling, I'm sure you probably were able to expunge a lot of the emotion when you were actually going back and looking at it and saying, okay, and, and one of the things that I always say to my, my writing students is, you know, get whatever you have to get down on the page. The work starts when you start editing and you look at those lines and you say, is this for me or is this for the reader? and understanding I had to write these lines maybe to get to this next line, but the reader doesn't need to see them. And I guess, again, what, what I'm feeling with this book is that there's, you have so much faith in your reader that you don't have to explain a lot by showing us through your actions. One, one of the most um, moving uh, passages in the book is one of the most mundane, uh, is when your mother-in-law makes the sun-dried bananas and it's not the act it's your devotion to depicting the act of what she does it's it's a page and a half you know you give birth and you, it gets a sentence but <laughs> you give a, a page and a half to you know sun drying bananas uh, can you talk about how, uh, the way that you use time to accelerate and slow down and bring the reader to a stasis 
I think, you know, it's it's about those moments that happen that were so essential. Like, that, that moment happened just before his death. I think just a day or two before it was kind of his last, you know, favorite meal. So, though, her making those was incredibly important to me. So, for some reason, you know, just as a creative act, I just, I had to really watch every moment of her making that. And I think it was such, it's, it was so much the way she expressed love for him. Um, you know, she didn't talk much, she didn't, but this woman who did this was, had so much love for my son. And I think that means so much to me and meant so much to me that, that I needed to, to follow her, to be with her as she was making that last meal for him, which I was too exhausted and overwhelmed with two other small children to even think about. You know, I, in the book I say he'd been asking for days, Mom, I really want some dried bananas. I'm like, yeah, 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 whatever. <laughs> Who's got the time? But, you know, our friend listened and, and she did it. Right. There, there, there's another another passage that I, I just adored was um, when you were in Seattle, I believe, and, and um, you take a moment out on the balcony. It's right when you're deciding that Jan's going to go home and there's a, a construction site across the way. Could you just describe that a little bit, what that moment was like and what you were seeing? Because it, again, it just to, to set it up as, uh, you know, we're understanding that the framework of cancer and the cancer cells, it's almost to me like, like you're looking into these cells across the way that are alive and thrumming with you. So this was a scene when, when we first went back to Thailand after we had been told that you know he had relapsed and he wasn't going to make it, um, we went back to Thailand and then there is a slight chance after a bone marrow transplant of um, something called graft versus host disease, which is after you've had a transplant, if there's sort of a battle inside and if the new marrow can win out over the dope, the, the original marrow, then there's a chance that the patient will survive. So, so the doctors actually have to let this illness kind of rage and it's dangerous because it can be fatal. Um, and then they swoop in at the last minute with steroids to stop the struggle. So he was in the midst of this. It was 21 days in the hospital in Bangkok with, um, he couldn't eat anything because he had all this digestive stuff. So he just had, I don't know, whatever feeding tube. And um, he was pretty miserable because he couldn't eat. He would, he would, he would, like groan in his sleep, sticky rice, sticky rice. So it was a rough 21 days in the hospital. And, um, but we did, we were on the seventh floor in Bangkok and we had this balcony. So a lot of times I would go out and at one point I was standing out there at night and um, in Bangkok, there's, it's, it's a huge bustling city and, and it's hot, you know, so things are exposed. Like it's, there's a construction site across the way and, um, and I'm just sort of describing watching the construction workers moving and, and uh, someone's downstairs in their kitchen and I can see the spoon stirring in the walk. And um, what I got to by writing that passage, which so many things, the, the reason I write is because I learn things as I write. But as I was writing about that, as I just felt moved to write about that, I realized by the end of writing it that there are just thousands and thousands of other lives around me, like right in view, all these apartments. And, and all, all of those lives, People have suffering, people have tragedy, people have illness and death, and um, it really gave me a sense of perspective, like, this is just one more little story, um, you know, in this big, huge world. So, it's, so again, it's like, it's not that unnatural to be going something, through something really difficult. It's what, it's the human condition. And it was an especially difficult event, but, you know, that's what happens in life. Well, yes, I, and I think that you make a good point there. I. Um, Use and, and probably anybody that, that um, works in creative nonfiction uses a book called Situation and the Story by Vivian Gornick. And if anybody is interested in memoir writing, you definitely have to pick up this book because it's, it's such an instructive way to enter your story. And as I was thinking in terms of this book, in terms of situation and story, basically the situation is a woman's, a, a family's child has cancer and is going to die. And that's the situation. The story is what you do with that. And the story is the journey that you take the reader on to tell us that story. And that's, that's where, it, you know, when, again, when you're, when you're dealing with uh, topics that are like this, they automatically evoke an emotion. I mean, you don't even have to, you don't have to say anything else. The boy, the six-year-old child died of cancer. 
you already have this evocative you know, reaction from, from a, a prospective reader. But it's not enough, that, because that is just the situation. And lots of children die of cancer, and a lot of people die of other things, and there are tragedies, and there is suffering everywhere. So it's taking it, it's taking it above the situation, what the event, the launching event is, and where the author takes that reader. And it is really through the life and the death, the, the birth, the life, and the death, which, which you cite at the end of the book, which is so interesting because you are framing it up for everyone because <laughs> it's inevitable, it's all out there for all of us, that, that this is just the natural bookend. You know, my child was born, he lived, and now he's going to die. And you make that such a matter-of-fact story that even someone as removed as a, a Westerner who doesn't um, share in the, the you know, the medical d decisions that, that, you know, other people might have made. It, it's like everything seemed inevitable in your story by the way that you were so uh, uh, natural about relaying it. And that is, the, the, to me, the thread that, that you pulled out of this event in your life that makes it not about the event. It makes it about humanity. And did, did, did you feel that as, as you were trying to lift the story up, or was it really, I just have to talk about what happened with me and my son? I think it's, um, I think it's a bit of a combination. I think, I think, you know, lifting it up and making it about humanity is what is art, right? So I think, um, trying to take what I'd written and and be sure that it was art, you know, be sure that it wasn't just a, like drag everybody down with a really sad story, um, is something, you know, that's where craft comes in and that's where um, it's universal because you're you're talking about specific, uh, specific sensory, you know, scenes that everybody can relate to in some way. So, so I guess, yeah, my answer is sort of like, the, it's a mix of those two things. Um, that the art makes it uh, accessible to everyone. Does that make any sense? Yeah, sure. Uh, I, and then, I, I guess, to, to, to piggyback on that, because we're talking about um, the, 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 the subject matter, and the, the subject matter in the promotional materials that I read about the book uh, would have been otherwise off-putting to uh, the publishing world, to editors, uh, and maybe you can tell a little bit about the journey of getting this book published, because that seemed very interesting too. So, so the book originally, I, I went to Stone Coast wanting to have my thesis be the book, you know, I said I want to finish this book, and uh, when it was time to have the thesis read, I had um, my first reader and then I had to choose a second reader, and I, because I had kind of gotten behind the eight ball, there weren't any second readers left at school, so I had to go <laughs> um, outside and I contacted um, an author that I had taken a workshop from years before, Anne Hood, and you all might be familiar with her. She's a prolific writer and she had a daughter die at age six, I believe, um, suddenly, and she wrote a grief memoir, a very short one called Comfort, which is just a, a wonderful book. Um, Anyway, she was my second reader, and when she read she read the thesis, she said, this has to be a book. This, I want this to be a book. And for years, she had planned to start an imprint specifically aimed at grief and loss, because the publishing industry is notorious for saying no to grief grief stories. They say, oh, people don't want to be depressed, and you know, it's too sad, and there are lots of theories about why that is. But she said, this is, you know, enough is enough. I want to see this published. So she went to Akashic Books and said, I want to start an imprint that is all focused on grief and loss, and I want Catherine's book to launch the imprint. So that's how uh, that started. And now, you know, and I think it's it is so important. You know, a lot of us who have experienced loss have been, you know, well-meaning friends give us books about grief and healing, but so often they're sort of like psychology, how-to, step-by-step things. And for most of us that I've talked to, they they just don't resonate. You know, what you need is you need real stories, real emotions, real. Um, experiences of people where you can cry, you know. People often ask me, well, can you recommend books? What did you read after Chan died? And I can only say poetry, you know, there just was, except for Anne Hood's book, Comfort, that was really helpful, but, but 
I don't know, there's some, you need literature, I think, in, in really hard times, not, not a how-to book, at least most, some people. Anyway. Before I respond to that, I just want to look out to the audience, to all aspiring writers, don't get your hopes up. Don't think that you're going to write a book and an author is going to say, I'm going to start an imprint because I want to see that published. <laughs> That's pretty miraculous. That is, I mean, that, and it's a testament to, to, to the beauty and the power of this book. But what I wanted to say was, uh, I think that we're scared to talk about grief and mourning and, again, you know, in, in our sanitized Western culture, people want you to get over it. People, you know, we, we want to look at everything with a timeline. It's like, okay, this event happened here, you go through that, you go through that, you go through that, and then it's over, on with life. And as someone who lost her beloved dad of a heart attack, boom, gone, when I was 26, he was 64, I was one of the first um, of my adult friends to lose a parent. I, I sort of felt like I was the pathfinder. You know, when, when our, our parents and family started going, um, my, my friends looked to me because I, 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 was, I had already started to forge that trail. Uh, and I've always been looking for literature, I, the books that, I, the, the, the genre is called morning memoir. Uh, and there's a lot of it out there, but it's also sometimes imbued with agenda. You know, somebody wants to settle a score or wants to show themselves in the martyred caregiver light. And caregiving, as anybody who has ever taken care of anyone knows, is it is a very mixed emotional bag without one or the other emotion going that I, I remember hearing an interview with an author when I was taking care of my mother and he was talking about his elderly father and he said, some days I hate him, some days I love him, I want him to live forever, I want him to die tomorrow. You know, that somebody could say that out loud, all of a sudden I was like, you can say that? You can say that? And you say that it more or less in turn, I mean, you know, and for, for us, those of us, you know, dealing with someone who's elderly and quote unquote, the time is right, to actually be able to say that out loud about a child. And that was, again, something that just like sprang up out of your book. Did, was that a revelation for you, that you could feel that way? Well, no, because I, you know it's so hard, as you all know, caregiving is so hard. So I was so exhausted, and, and also so hard to see that the patient in so much pain, you know, to see my son suffering so much. So, my mind was always jumping back and forth, but you know, like, I need to keep him alive, or, you know, n no, it's better if he dies, he's so unhappy, or, you know, it's always trying to figure that out. So, I don't know, I think um, in writing the book, I just, again, you know, it started as a journal. I didn't, I didn't ever write any of it thinking anyone would ever read a word of it, you know, so it was easy to be really honest because um, I didn't plan on it ever being read. But then, you know, later when it was time to publish, I went ahead and shared that because that's, that's, I felt like it just showed how hard it was. And I don't think anybody would, you know, think that I love my child less that, that I felt like it might be right for him to die. Um, but it took, you know, it, it's 14, it took 12 years between his death until the book was written. Um, so there's no way that I probably could have felt comfortable saying that within the first 10 years, you know, it was, it was 12 years of, of crying and, and grieving, really. I mean, I worked really hard grieving in those 12 years, not just with the writing, which, which was hard and a way of grieving, but also just, just crying with, with loved ones and patient friends. Um, and it was that grieving and that healing, I think, that allowed me to be comfortable saying, I wanted my child to die because it was so hard and because I didn't like to see him suffer. Right, but you actually even confess, I want this to be over for me too. Mm -hmm. Which again, you know, that, that's, that's, it's one thing to say I want somebody to go because I want to end their suffering. It's another thing to confess, I want, I want this to be over for me too. I can't do this anymore. And I, I, I remember sitting in parking lots of nursing homes and hospitals and, you know, with, with my head on the steering wheel, it's like, I can't do this anymore. I can't do this anymore. And you know, we can, and we do. It doesn't mean that we want to, we don't want that, but 
saying those words out loud, again, just sprung up off the page to me as such an act of courage and candor because that's the reaching out. It's not, I'm sad because my son's dying. That, that, that takes no courage. But saying, I am tired of doing this and I want him to go for him, but I want him to go for me too. And even if it was in a moment, and then you say, I mean, because again, later you say, well, am I glad he's gone? No, I mean, you know, would, would I rather have him still be here suffering just a little bit less? Yes, but we don't get to make that choice. So in stacking, stacking the narrative that way, I think it just, again, opened up so much humanity to anybody who would read that book. And again, probably why I didn't, I didn't cry. I, I just, I, I maybe I felt your relief. I mean, and there's lots of tears in this book. <laughs> Everybody, I, and this is the beautiful thing, is that in that culture, from everything that I, you know, gleaned out of that book, is it, emotions are everywhere. When you have your, your, when you have Cody, your first child, how, how long do you get taken care of? Yeah, like a good month or something. Yeah. Right, a whole month, a whole month. It's like, oh, she had a child. You stop, we'll do everything for a month. That's happened to everybody out here who's had children, right? That's how the world works over here. But it's the same thing with, with losing with losing Chan. Everybody just came in and took over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, that, I mean, I felt really lucky to be in a culture where those structures were so clearly in place. You know, what happens when someone dies? Is the, the community stepped in and, and totally took charge and I didn't have to do anything except be there to, you know, remember my son. Um, it's interesting though, you know, that there are these structural things that are very helpful in grieving, but then there's this other parts of it where they, they were very much not helpful to me. So I was told that it was the morning uh, he died, and so it was the first day of the funeral, and I was sitting next to his body with um, his father and his brothers, and, and I kept crying, you know, his tears kept falling, and I had neighbor after relative after cousin tell me, stop crying, don't cry. You know, you're going to upset him. You're going to upset the spirit. You're going to, and um, and that was not helpful. You know, the, for me as an American, as the way I needed to grieve was not like that. So it's you know, it was, it's a mixed. It's not like everything was wonderful and fabulous about being in another culture. But I I did really appreciate those, um, you know, the parts of the structure. Can you talk a little bit about going up to the funeral pyre? Mm hmm. I don't know, you know what, I feel like I want people to kind of, I feel like people have to be sort of led into those especially okay. like tender moments. I mean, I'm okay to talk about it, but I, I feel like I, I would rob people of their, yes. of getting there on their I, own. I understand that. Well, I have a, th th then let's talk a little bit about your, um, your solace through this. I, I felt that there was, it, you were so isolated and so alone in your, I mean, even, even within your marriage that it felt, this felt like such a solo journey. And yet there were these moments of like you're calling your, your Melissa or whoever it was and having you know these phone conversations and you use the expression of letting them take off your, and hold your armor of courage. Can you talk a little bit about the, the moments of solace in this? Um, so one thing that I did when things were really hard because I, you know, we were up on this mountaintop, I didn't really have any close friends, but I did have a cell phone um, and I could get reception if I hiked up to the top of this mountain near our cabin and um, so I would call a friend in, in Seattle and, and she would, she, I would cry and, uh, you know, we would take turns, I would talk, she was also a mom, so I would talk and then she would talk, but um, but yeah, I describe it in the book as a moment of being able to take off that armor of courage. You know, that when I was the mother, I couldn't break down. You know, you know that's how it is when you're a caregiver, when you're a parent. You have to be the one who's staying strong. And But in those moments, I could really, I could um, just stop and say the unspeakable. You know, like, uh, you know, I'm afraid he's going to die. Or, you know, these things that I couldn't say in my family. And... And it just was so helpful to have a mother, another mother there who could listen to me and kind of be the one to, to say, I, I know you're strong, I know you can handle this, but go ahead right now, it's your time to be a mess. So that was really helpful. In, interesting in, in mothering, I, I was uh, on, on my, my, my um, non-sobbing Sunday, 
<laughs> I actually listened to a public radio program called On Being. I don't know if it's, yes. Um, it, and it felt like the, 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 all of these things that were happening in your world were now kind of swirling around me. I just, um, the, the, the guests were um, a, a married couple, Glennon Doyle, uh, and her wife, Abby Wambach, who was a, an Olympian um, uh, soccer player, but they were talking about parenting. And I just want, I want to read this because it, it feels so much in, in concert with everything that you talked about taking care. Um, she says, and this was Glennon, we say all the time with our kids, everything's a pattern. It's first the pain, then the waiting, then the rising, over and over and over again. And then we skip the pain, and when we skip the pain, we just never get to this rising. We got this parenting memo that everything would be okay if we just never let anything bad ever happen to our children, ever, as long as they gave us the babies. We're like, take her home and just never let a human being happen, it never let being human happen to this child. Don't let anyone ever frown at her, don't let her lose anything, don't let a drop of rain fall into her head, and then everything will be fine. It took me till my kids were 10 to figure out that parenting, the parenting memo was complete BS and that we don't let our kids fail. We don't let our kids feel. They don't learn to learn how to become human. One of my greatest challenges in my personal life and in my parenting is to just look at my kids and say, I'm not going to protect you from this. I'm going to let you fail here. I'm going to let you feel that. Yes, life is that hard. It's hard to be human, and I'm not going to grab that from you. And that's how I, it, it was as though you were sitting there talking to me about giving Chan his death, that you didn't take it away from him, that you didn't protect him from it, that you accompanied him with it, but you let him have it and own it and, and take it out in his, all his pain and all his suffering, you let him have that. And to me, that seemed like the greatest leap of faith that a mother could possibly have. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't know how you were able morally to do that. I mean, I just kept saying, she's so brave, she's so brave. Did it feel brave at the time? No. Um. I think, though, as a parent, I al always did I, I agree with that. I felt really clear that you cannot, we, as, all we want as parents is to protect our children. That's the most important thing. But we can't. And it was always very clear to me that I couldn't protect them from bad things happening, but I could be there for them to process when bad things happened. Or, you know, I, so I think that was just so ingrained in me by the time he was sick and dying was that I was only there, um, you know, to witness what he was going through and to allow him space to have feelings about it. Well, I think, again, that's where the book uplifted for me then when we came to that moment where you let him go. And with that, you let us go, the, the reader go. And it was, it was hopeful, as, as heartbreaking as that moment was, you gave us hope hope in saying this is part of nature, this is part of what we're doing, and we show the love by letting go. I'd like to ask you about your experience sharing your story both with people directly and through the book. I've spent a lot of time, but always in the West, photographing children who are about to die, young children, or have died or are stillborn. And what's striking is that these parents who are in utter grief become the consolers of, them who, of those who hear the news. When I tell people my mother, who's 92, was in the hospital last week, and she's out now, well, that happens. When I told them that my four-day-old four was in intensive care many years ago, that can't be. It's not possible. I have no space to, to to, to accommodate that. And when you said that, you know, all of us are going through tragedies, the, the severe illness or the death of a young child is a tragedy that, at least in the, in the West, rises to be a different kind of an event, an event that's, that's never supposed to happen, and we don't know how to make space for it. I don't know what it was like for you. 
read the book. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that observation. I just wanted to make a comment. Uh, I've only read about a quarter of the book so far, but I'm not a person that feels like I'm very good with words, but I can certainly resonate to people that write and read voraciously. Uh, and in reading what I've read so far, I do feel like I'm being carried along with that river, you know, along with you. Uh, the images, the smells, the, you know, the, what I'm hearing, what I'm seeing, my imagination. I feel like I'm right in there. And even though I know somewhat where the book is going, um, I trust that I'll be able to take that journey because of what I've read so far. I feel like it, it's going to be a difficult yet kind of journey. Thank you. I don't know if the book addresses it, but how did his brothers go through this journey? Is, is it throughout the book? That's a good question. Um, no, the book really ends 100 days after his death. So, or I guess if you ask how they went through the journey of the book, um, they, were, they were aware that he had an illness he could die from. You know, we tried not to candy coat that, but we also wanted to, you know, we didn't want to put the idea into their heads that your brother's going to die. So that was a really, I, I think I do address that in the book, that that was a really hard path for me to walk of where, where that line is. And that's something, you know, I, I, I talk to um, hospital oncologists and, and um, doctors in children's hospitals, and, and that's such a, a live issue. You know, people always want to know, how do we, how do we handle that? I just want to ask if uh, Buddhism has played a role in your life or in the story. Yeah, that was that was a big gift when I first moved to Thailand right after college. I started reading about I mean, ninety some percent of people in Thailand are Buddhist. It's part of the the schooling and the government. And so I started to study Buddhism. And I and as soon as I started learning about this idea of mindfulness and trying to stay present and not getting lost in future thoughts and past, I thought it sounded really intelligent. Um, so I started meditating. Um, I started a practice of meditation at that point. So that by the time Chan was ill, I had really internalized to a very helpful degree the idea that we can't control the future, that we have to, the best way to live is to buy, is to be as present in the moment as possible. Not that I'm any good at, at, at it, um, but at least I knew I was supposed to do that. And, uh, and I think that was a huge, a huge help because because as so often when I was in the throes of fear and terror and worry, I would just remind myself, okay, I, there's nothing I can, there's no point in being lost here. Just just focus on the spoon in my hand and the soup in the bowl and <coughs> my child over here needing me and just stay there. So yeah, that was a huge, huge part of my journey. Thank you.